It seems like giant tech companies get press coverage for privacy concerns even more than for new product launches. How do we end up in this world of playing catch up with the ethical implications of technology? Quantum computing is still relatively new, but its impact on machine learning and encryption alone will have major repercussions for all our futures. Can we avoid the mistakes of the past and build ethics into this field? Let's get a little less nerdy on this episode of the post-quantum world. I'm your host, Konstantinos Kragianis. I lead quantum computing services at Protivity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. So our guest today is co-founder and director of AeroQ Quantum Hardware. Uh, welcome, Faye Waddleton. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great. Um, I, I mean, we're going to be talking about something that we've never touched on in this show. Uh, and, I, and I think it never gets touched on in a lot of technological areas, which is why we have so many problems. <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about ethics, of course. So uh, I just wanted to take a step back and, and let you um, explain how you got involved in ethics and technology. Uh, and then I guess how it sort of turned into ethics and quantum technology. Well, thank you for having me today and for these very provocative questions that you uh, sent my brain into overdrive thinking about. Um, but <laughs> it was a, it was really a, a, a very interesting and stimulating exercise to think about this discussion. And that um, caused me to think back to where I started, which was many years ago in the healthcare field. Um, my background is in nursing. I have a graduate degree in nursing. Uh, and if there is ever a field that has been ethically challenged because of its past violations, it is healthcare delivery. Um, and the biochemist um, and, and the bioethicist have had to grapple with, and are still, we're still grappling with some of the remnants of the lack of ethical considerations, which very often are pro, are, do not precede, but often follow technical and other kinds of scientific developments. Um, and uh, my, uh, the latter part of my career, the bulk of my career, I guess I should say, is in the area of prevention um, to alleviate the problems before they occur. Um, family planning and reproductive health is a field that by and large is anchored in prevention and thinking about the consequences of future actions. Um, again, an ethically challenged field that is a source of and focus of enormous public debate right now. So quantum seems like just another day at the office uh, in considering, um, but not really because of the implications of quantum and the potential to really change the way we look at information and how we process information and the, and the dangers that are already before us in not thinking about prospectively, thinking about the implications of the powers that we are discovering and are attempting to um, um, make possible, make it accessible to a broad base of, of human development. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And, and of course, I, I definitely don't want to touch on the medical field in this podcast. <laughs> that well, opens a can lessons. of worms with what's going on. <laughs> no, but there, yeah. are lessons to be, there are lessons to be learned about how the world can evolve when you don't attempt to make a, a framework, to set a framework and to gain consensus. Yeah. Um, it goes eventually to very rigid regu regulatory uh, imposition of your practices. So I think there, are, you know, we don't need to get into it, but I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Yeah, definitely. And, and there's lessons we learned in just technology, right? I mean, let's talk about the mistakes of the 90s. Um, I, I feel like at that time period, we just dove into the Internet um, and it was just, let's do whatever we can, you know, <laughs> and we went full, full speed ahead. And of course, besides the bubble bursting, um, there, there are other implications of what happened, right? Well, but we didn't just dive right in. You know, the Internet came up on us from mid-century. Um, that's sometimes hard for people to recognize that these tools oh, yeah, yeah. and the development of them was were, were well underway uh, before the latter part of the 20th century. And here we are in the first quarter of the 21st century. 
it took people imagining what the potential would be for these enormous powers that we we had gained and had evolved, and that have, were challenging laws of nature that even Einstein said were not possible. Uh, and it took the imagination of people to think ahead as to what this could possibly mean. What happens if we develop this machine? What happens? Oh, we developed that. We created that potential, that power. Maybe we can take it a step farther. Um, but that's, again, a lesson that I think we can learn from the 90s, that there was a great deal of attention to development of the technology and whatever the problems were and are, because we are dealing with them now, we address retrospectively as opposed to what did we do before and how do we engage more broadly and, and in a way that builds consensus that we can avoid some of the problems of the 90s and the early 21st century. Yeah, it was kind of a failure of imagination. You know, we created this network, we had these primitive looking web pages, and, and who would have thought they can lead to any issues? Who would have thought there could be privacy implications, right? They were static billboards at the time. You know, well, you didn't think of them as... Thinking, but there were people thinking about that, but their voices were not engaged. Mm -hmm. They were not sought after. They were considered fringe. They were considered obstruct uh, obstructionist uh, that were standing in the way of technology and development and advancement. Uh, and so now we grapple with it and the, the problems are enormous. Um, but that's why this work now is so important that we not sit by the wayside to say, well, let's wait until quantum is really online and people are really using it and then we'll worry about it. And I think that would be a mistake and would, would reflect that we have not learned from the sins of the past. Yeah, to me, it feels a little bit like at the time we couldn't understand all the possibilities ahead of us. So we didn't worry about all the possibilities ahead of us. And I feel like with quantum, it's similar. Like we know some of the big use cases. We know some of the things we want to use these machines for. But I still have this like sneaky suspicion that we don't even know 1% of what these machines are going to be used for within a few decades, you know, and we're right back to the beginning. You know, who would have dreamed of things like Facebook when we were first looking at go for well but we can we can you know? dream about it now because we've yeah. lived with facebook and we've lived with other mm -hmm. uh technology platforms and so we can dream and and we can think about well this is where we are what ifs and i think in the past we have not you know we're so focused on on the development of the technology and the people who are engaged in the development of technology sort of kind of like you know, the bioethical conundrum, the people who are doing the work, doing the research, their heads are down in the work and, and broader, and then it gets released upon society. And there has not been an input to say, wait a minute, let me think about that a minute. What ifs? And I think it, there is an opportunity now to bring a broader a circle of stakeholders to say what ifs. And that is one of the initiatives that ERIQ has committed itself to, to convene experts from fields other than the quantum field, other than the, the world of physics, to say what it means and what are the implications for their particular area of work and expertise and how might this enhance what they do what are the problems that they see that might arise that need to be at least addressed? There will be no big bang event that suddenly quantum is up on us. Just as the internet evolved over decades, so will quantum. It will not be immediately accessible to the whole world overnight. We wake up one day and all of a sudden our machines are in quantum. And so let's, you know, I think we have an opportunity to really take advantage of this time. And have any of you met yet in that context? Have you started? We have started talking to uh, people who are interested in doing this. We uh, produced a paper on quantum and ethics and what we thought were the problems of, of not opening the circle for discussion and consideration. Um, you know, when you, when you need to build consensus, that's really pretty hard and long-term work. Uh, and it means that you really have to open the circle if there's to be consensus. And of course, uh, there's great aversion to there being immediate rec regulatory restrictions. Um, so building a consensus is a, a step or two, or maybe even 
a leap forward in in people understanding the complexity of quantum physics and and the application of the technology which is a big challenge because a lot of i mean you know there's a whole world that has that have never heard the word quantum so the challenge is enormous and before the pandemic we had struck an agreement with columbia through their columbia seminars to bring in a, a small group of uh, thought leaders to begin to frame out some of the the aspects of a discussion that could inform um, a, a dialogue in the future. And we, we intend to get back to that work now that uh, the forums are opening and makes that physically possible for us to gather and begin the discussions. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask you about some of those in a moment. Um, but I guess the elephant in the room with ethics and quantum is probably one of the things you're going to be discussing with them. And that's... Um, are we building machines that will render much of today's encryption and cryptocurrency obsolete? I mean, that's the big one, right? That's the juggernaut. Uh, so it's inevitable. I mean, I feel like that's where it's going to go. And, and of course, we're trying to now reverse engineer post-quantum cryptography to protect against that. And that's part of what we do here. We help companies prepare for that. But um, how do you, how do you feel about that? I mean, this inevitability. Well, I feel the genie is out of the bottle, and we're that kind of conversation is wishful thinking um, because the science is moving forward, as does science in all sorts of examples of the past, um, and there is no putting the the cap back on the bottle. Um, there, this is now a worldwide phenomenon over which we do not have sovereign control. Um, and we can take our destiny in our own hands or we can put our head in the sand and say, this is all unethical for you to undo my cryptography. But no, we are engaged in the frontier of moving science forward. And the, the, the challenge for us is how do, we do, how do we make it for good and hopefully avoid the, the violations that we are grappling with this very day as you and I are having this conversation? How do we avoid the questions around privacy and data mining and um, invading uh, information about individuals and keeping them and, and using them inappropriately um, and keeping them beyond their useful um, uh, intent, original intent, just for the purpose of making money, because that's the business model. So there, we are. We should be taking the lessons that we are grappling with and and applying them to the future to, for future consideration. Uh, as we have, as we are more, we have more greater power and greater speed to process information. On the good side of it, hopefully there will be better drugs, better medication. I mean, uh, uh, scientific pharmaceutical developments. There will be an enormous amount of information that we now don't have at our fingertips and do not have the time to wait for it, that quantum will give us the capacity to embrace and to in investigate more effectively and more accurately. Um, I was a part of a conversation earlier today about uh, Alzheimer's and the information that it has taken years and years to accumulate um, and it, that has led to a complete rethinking about how we treat this devastating disease. And I s sat thinking that it, how, how useful quantum processing, if we were at that stage of development, might have been and how many lives might have been saved if we'd had the benefit of this data 20 years ago, if we had known that Alzheimer's is not a seven to 10 year disease, it's a 25 year disease, uh, but that has only come about by painstaking labor with the instruments that are at our fingertips, but that a future generation of processing would bring to our knowledge much more quickly. So when you're discussing issues like this, um, what, what kind of, um, output do you expect from like this panel in the future, for example, like, are they just, are they papers? What, what, what kind of calls to action? I'm just curious about that aspect of it. Like what you hope well, to get the industry to do. 
First of all, um, I think just helping people understand what quantum is, because this is a, this is a oh, yeah. new word. <laughs> <laughs> a daily challenge, a absolutely. Word. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And Every call, I'm like, wait, yeah. D- does he know? Does she know? Who do I have to explain to? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But you don't have to go to the laboratory and do the, the experiments to, to be uh, knowledgeable or to gain knowledge about uh, the implications of the technology. Um, and so I think that we envision, as I said earlier, uh, we produced and published probably the most comprehensive paper on ethics, ethical considerations in quantums uh, about three years ago. Uh, we intend to build on that. We intend to bring um, people from the sciences, from um, or the earth sciences, from the medical sciences, from philosophy, from communications, from politics, uh, from computer sciences, from a, a range of professions. Um, and, you know, you can, there can be a, a primer on quantum, but more importantly, to think about, well, if you have these powers that you can process data more effectively in your world more extensively, more quickly, that that information is accessible to you in your lifetime, because some of the information in our lifetime, we will never know based on the current technology. What would you do with it? And how would it advance your particular area of expertise? What would dangers would arise with that kind of knowledge? How could it be misused? How could it be used for the benefit of your profession, but also how might it be, be misused? And what do you see within your profession that it would take to build a consensus around the ethical considerations of quantum in your profession? We hope to commission papers that would be be of the uh, thought leader caliber, not just papers for academic consumption, but rather papers that would help people to think about what the implications might be and how we might begin to talk about bringing a consensus of good behavior with respect to quantum and to think about who's going to benefit and who will have the uh, have access to a better quality of life because of this knowledge and information power. Yeah, and, and to help bring it into more present day examples, um, quantum's going to also do some things that we currently do just a lot better. And machine learning is a great example of that. Uh, so I, I thought it would be good to frame a few questions here around uh, the mistakes we've seen in machine learning and, and how we can learn about what quantum might do to possibly exacerbate those. So, so when you think about just those general AI machine learning type mistakes we made, do you feel there's anything being done um, to address the ethics of them now? And how will they be made way worse with something like quantum machine learning? Well, I think, yes, there are a lot of folks who are talking about the implications of bias in machine learning, unintended bias, um, that the, um, the, the rather elitist access to machine learning that, that is not broadly available to others, uh, the misuse of data and information that machine learning gives us, and the possibility of, of um, general access to, uh, to AI. Uh, and what, how that data gets used is something that is creating a great deal of concern and a great deal of, of attention now. Um, and I, even though the, it might be a kind of a, a, a scary moment for the folks who are involved in technology, I think, you know, it was time for a little shakeup to, to, for us to kind of rethink these business models. Do, do we really in the long run want people to have access to our personal data ad infinitum because they can make money and they can use it and they can plummet and they can, uh, they can push this data and pump the data? for the purpose of of, uh, the success of a corporate entity? Or is it used in a a way that is intended um, and that the the power to do so doesn't mean that you should do so? Um, So uh, these, uh, nothing will be resolved overnight in a split second decision. There won't be a big bang as I earlier mentioned. There, we gain. We should gain from our mistakes. We should get, think about. Well, you know, we made a mistake in terms of not being more 
careful about the limitations of I mean, of uh, artificial intelligence and the data that is kept. And we needed more framework around that data in terms of what's permissible. The Europeans have done a pretty interesting job around that fairly early on. Um, and we could use their example, even we, even though we have not embraced it as, as rigidly as they have, have circumscribed how data, personal data can be used. I think that the, the greatest fear that people have is that their personal and private lives will be invaded by external forces over which they do not have control. And that is certainly likely to happen when you don't do the hard work of building understanding and, and consensus among trusted leaders and thought leaders who help to think through before the tragedies occur, what is possible? Do we really need to have technology that begins to prep kids into Facebook kids so that there's a pipeline for one corporation? Is that really what are what are the dangers? You know, what are the benefits and what are the dangers? And uh, it you know it does take some courage because you're pushing against enormous corporate entities. Um, but we've done that before. Uh, again, I refer my refer you to my medical background uh, in terms of um, you know ground zero for the violations and the, the many really examples of, of, of human rights abuses and inequity in, in access. Also, uh, if there's anything that we have seen out of this pandemic. It is a lack of equitable access to healthcare and to wellness, um, based on uh, having not uh, having access to the technology. I mean, we just look at the kids in poor neighborhoods who didn't have access to the technology, and that the remote was learning, or, yeah, the remote mm -hmm. learning, and that was unclothed yeah. when when the pandemic came upon us. Um, was anybody ever? I mean, I you know, I even before the pandemic, I had had participated in in game conversations around what if there is a pandemic you know that people in healthcare uh, communities do talk about that um but i don't think anyone anticipated or imagined the implications for for a whole sector of the population that very often is poorly understood and very often neglected and the the cover came off of it in this particular um, um, crisis that we have been in with uh, COVID-19. Uh, so that's that's an example, I think, of where we can do a better job in thinking and imagining what ifs. Yeah. And, and I like to think that we're sort of at a point where we can make a difference early and learn from mistakes. So, so with AI, sure, quantum machine learning will have the ability to handle way larger data sets one day. Um, get us results way faster, maybe more accurately, right. and then we'll have advantage. Um, so at that point, would it be nice we, if we were just that simple? But it won't be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Can't we just now institute some safeguards that we never put there in the past? Like we have, a, we, it's almost like we have a a chance to go back in time and do machine learning all over again. Well, that's exactly <laughs> like we, what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, yeah. there's a reason why they went out in the in the wilderness and and Silomar to say. You know, this is the way we're going to behave in our labs, and uh, let's set some ethical standards for ourselves. Let's um, say these are the things we won't do in in um, in DNA research. Um, and yeah. I think there there are lots of examples of of grappling with ethical considerations in advancement. Quantum is not the first rodeo in advancement. Let's let's be clear about that. It is not the first time we've had major advancement that have had worldwide implications. Um, we don't need to start from go to think about how we educate, begin to think about the enormous tasks of education and creating awareness and understanding. The other thing is that we now live in a world that people have experience with technology. We're not 
we're not neophytes any longer, let alone uh, beginners, but there is a great depth of experience with technology. Uh, so building on that knowledge and that utilization, an enormous broad-based utilization, um, we, we, we should take lessons from the past because you, know, you are designed to repeat the mistakes of the past if you don't pay attention to what we did in the past and move this forward in the, in the development, with the development of quantum. And people don't have to go into the laboratory, as I said earlier, uh, to do a quantum experiment, to be able to conceptualize and to grapple with what it might mean in their particular focus of work. Yeah, and, and we get some weird requests when it comes to um, our use cases and, and the proof of concepts operativity that we work on for customers. And one that keeps coming up is this idea of explainability. Um, and, you know, can you explain to, to regulator, like why a decision was made <laughs> in, in that black box of machine learning? So it would be fascinating if we could focus on explainability with quantum and then maybe do it right this time, be able to show why a decision was made, show that it's fair, so show that, that everything was balanced. Or show that, that someone other than the creator of this technology had some input and, and was invited to uh, to have an opinion about the implications. That's where I think we have an opportunity. And I know there's a great deal of conversation about this is too early. Um, it's the, the technology is still in its nascent um, stage of development. Um, just think about what we were we were saying um, even five years ago that there is really no proof of concept. Um, and how quickly the technology has galloped forward. Um, you know, you kind of reach an inflection point in any development um, that it kind of chugs along at a very snail's pace, small um, primary level of work. Uh, and then there is a seminal point in which the trigger just kind of sets everything into motion. I suspect that we'll, we will see that in this particular phase of our uh, information processing uh, advancement as well. So there's a degree of unpredictability. The, you know, I'm not suggesting that there isn't hard work and, and very technical, highly technical work to be done that just has to be done. The steps have to be forward, uh, followed as we forward our, our work. But it doesn't, it's never too early to start thinking about the future. I mean, my whole career has been spent on thinking about the future and preventing the disasters that can befall those who don't think about the future. And it wasn't about quantum. I didn't need to be able to explain people to, to women uh, how a particular method of contraception was, was made or produced for them to understand what this meant in their lives and to imagine the potential that they could uh, control in their lives if they made a certain decision. Um, the, that's very simplistic and basic, but I'm saying that that universally the same principles apply. Uh, and it, it, and I contend that it is not too early to begin to think about, even if we spend some time looking back at what we've done right in AI and what did we do wrong, what did we do right, in the biomedical considerations and do we really want the kind of rigid regulatory processes to befall quantum that have befallen the medical establishment? Um, probably not. And so there is a learning curve for the profession that uh, I think is, is very important for, for, for there to be attention given. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and it sounds like since you've dealt with all avenues um, from, from medical to here, you, you've thought about society as a whole <laughs> in, in different yes. ways. And so what do we do now? How do we make sure that all these advantages that quantum promises can benefit society as a whole? You know, not just about like the fears of doing it wrong, but just the benefits, you know, make sure that everyone's getting something out of this. Well, it's hard work. It's long term work. And it's more than just our little sandbox here in America. It's work that requires multilateral collaboration. Um, work in quantum is going on around the globe. It's recognizing that, that, that you can't ignore 
uh, the efforts that that a number of of uh, countries have made sovereign commitments uh, to the development of their quantum technology. Uh, so I think that the multilateral um, institutions need to be brought into uh, the, the into dialogue as well. It's an enormous task before us. And, and again, I, I, as I said a few moments ago, uh, there's a great deal of criticism there. We often hear criticism, it's too early. We don't, we, you know, we don't need to concern ourselves with that. Nothing is going to be locked down, tick and tied, as the accountants would describe it, um, to be precise and rigid. But the engagement is what is really important. And the recognition that part of the engagement is gaining an understanding about this new and really different technology, but has the potential to really reset the world in terms of access to information. Um, and that takes a long term to, to accomplish, takes a lot of work and a lot of uh, diligence, a lot of naysayers who will say that you won't tell us what to do. Um, but the atmosphere has to be charged with the intent to bring as many constituencies as possible into the tent of thinking and understanding about the potential for quantum computing. Yeah, and that's that's how it affects the world. But sometimes I also think, wait, this is a new industry, right? Like, so because it's a new industry, do we also have one other possible reset here? One other thing that we can do right that we did wrong? Like, can we, is there a way to now be better build diversity throughout the quantum stack and the industry, you know, from that side? Not just the people who are benefiting from it, but just the people in it. <laughs> like, like, it's almost like you have a new chance here, you know? There's no old boys clubs, for example, right? It's a brand new industry. So um, how do you feel well, about it, that? Well, it's just, I mean, well, first of all, it's not just an industry. It really mm -hmm. is a sector of technology that will, yeah. will impact many industries. Um, and there is, a, a, there is turbulence in the land around uh, who is included and who is excluded and the necessity that many voices and faces be permitted and be a part of the be at the table and to be a part of any advancement of human development. Um, if we want to speak of the industry, just take a look at the photographs in the industry and it would appear that we are destined to repeat the patterns of the past. Um, People who are working on quantum technology these days still are largely white men. Um, I'm not. I'm an African-American woman. And I think my sensibilities about the experience of being a member of, a, of a, a, a minority group perhaps creates the kind of sensitivity and urgency that I feel um, the necessity for bringing a broader circle of voices into the conversation if for no other reason than just to learn about the the technology that it's coming, even if they are not in a position to have great influence, well, they might influence the person who does have the capacity to have impact. So I, I don't see this as an industry. Um, I see it as an industry of, of people developing the technology. And even there, there are multiple ways in which the technology is being developed, not everyone is pursuing the same pathway. Um, as a part of ERQ, we are in the electrons and uh, in, in helium, and we are on that pathway as, as, as a singular path because we feel that it has the capacity to um, be the most stable um, uh, hardware and to scale up more effectively than some of the other methodologies. Um, but there, there are many people on this path, uh, on this journey, uh, and, and different pathways. Uh, so I, I, you know, I just feel that um, I, I can't say it enough that it's really important uh, to see the circle of stakeholders beyond those who are creating the science and the technology. Um, the science and the technology are largely led today by white men. Uh, there are there is some evidence that there are efforts being made to bring women in, uh, but that's about it. 
we it does the 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 industry does not look like the rest of the world. A lot of that probably has to do with who is trained in in the sciences of of engineering and physics and the other mm -hmm. uh, disciplines that are required for this development. Um, so it, it really is a mirror image on the lack of diversity throughout our society. Yeah, and I think this is an opportunity for a great reset. <laughs> you know, if we could better identify curriculums, uh, I, I've been trying to push, I've actually worked with uh, University of Chicago, Maryland, uh, trying to get across uh, to some places this idea of a curriculum that would yield a, a coder, someone who's ready to like actually contribute in quantum information science. and. Um, can we push that out and can we lure, you know, diversity of all types, right? You know, male, female, every race. Um, it, it's a, it's an opportunity. That's what's exciting here. You know, let's grab them while they're young right. and, and convince them that they want to learn how to like sling some qubits for the greater good. Right, right, right. But, but I think it has to be before college. It really needs mm -hmm. to start uh, really in primary school with a basic conceptual framework that we learn about math and science yeah. um, and 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 our children should be thinking about the future of the technology that they will inherit and the foundation for that as i said earlier i don't think we should uh, should in any way underestimate the enormity of the ta of the task that task not to produce the qubits but to produce the people to get ready to use the qubits that's sure. really an enormous long-term task and yes we college is fine but it really goes back to primary and the foundation that gets laid that gets them into the into the programs that allows them to go through the door of a higher level of technological advancement and uh, the skills that will be required in the next few years it's not so far off yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I, yeah, I'm all yeah. I'm all for building that new workforce because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I already see it. I'm extrapolating and I know we're going to need a lot of uh, a lot yeah, of hands on even, keys right here. If, for even if, you know what, even if it isn't in the if, if it doesn't end up being in the workforce, just as a, an awareness as mm -hmm. a member of society, as a citizen of the world, as um, a participant in public policy formation, um, you know, there are national security implications. Uh, the implications are vast, that this will superpower artificial intelligence in a way that uh, today we probably would not recognize. Uh, so it's not just a more complex math problem. It really does have a multitude of implications. And that's the reason that a lot of work needs to be done broader than the development of the science. Even if the science for some reason lags and that, that we haven't been able to deal, you know, really um, uh, solve the vibration problems and the, the decoherence problems, um, it's still a dialogue worth generating and worth thinking about, and not just around quantum issues, but many of societal's uh, challenges and problems that we grapple with on a daily basis. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I was hoping to end with something easy that we could solve like that. That's great. <laughs> you know, something that we can well, figure out just it, like tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? We don't need to figure it out. We just need to work at it. Okay. I mean, yeah, and I we need to adapt as things develop, as as the world develops. Um, it, you know, we we can only if we do nothing, that is really the violation of the privilege that we've been given. But if we work at something in your and my lifetime, and I'm much older than you, we will we will leave still a lot to, for people to do. But, you know, um, um, let us not uh, say that we didn't do anything because we were waiting around until the right time but rather that we looked back to say, well, what were the standards and can we expand and build on the ethical considerations that for which there is broad consensus and, 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 broad, and, and has come about in some examples in a very out and very painful violations. Um, we are in the midst of one of those stages now that the reaction to the data utilization is very upsetting to people. Um, and out of that, if 
We don't prospectively think about what quantum might mean for the personal data and privacy. We're likely to have the kind of backlash that we're in the midst of right now that invites greater scrutiny and greater regulation and greater restriction, as opposed to trying to think about and framing and saying, well, wait a minute, we gave some thought to that. And here is how we think we might might be the rules of consensus as we move forward. Now, some of that, of course, will be informed and, and, um, and designed through case law. There will be certainly challenges in the judicial sector. Um, there will be challenges in the political sector. It's very encouraging that the, uh, the uh, Biden administration has set up a, a White House office on quantum technology. Um, so there is a recognition of the breadth of this technology and its implications beyond just the design and the, the, um, the science of the technology. I agree. Thanks for um, really broadening this whole uh, topic, because <laughs> I'm sure people yeah. who are going to be listening to this were like, whoa, I didn't think of any of this. Um, and I'd love to, sure to give them will. more to, yeah, give them more to grab onto. I, I could, in the show notes, link uh, the paper. Um, and uh, anything else you might want to share? Is there anything else you yes. want to share? The well, uh, the, our paper, the title of our paper is The Time to Talk About the Ethics of Quantum Computing is Now. Uh, okay. Nice and, and easy to remember. And yeah. <laughs> it's like the end to remember. But most of all, it is not a subject that you put off for a later date. Um, and it should not be limited to those who are creating the technology, but should be broadened to those who have an ins a stake in its application and its utilization. Thanks so much for all these big concepts. Okay. I really appreciate having you on. Thank Thanks. you for having me. We recently added a new short segment here called Coherence, the Quantum Executive Summary. Let's recap. Quantum computing is not going to have a big bang type moment. We'll continue to see major advances, each with their own ethical considerations. The time is now to start having discussions around what stakeholders need to do to avoid the types of negative impacts found in past technological advances. AeroQ is working on a new type of quantum computer we covered in a past episode, but is clearly also concerned with ethics. Faye Waddleton is involved in pulling together participants from the industry to start having much needed conversations and working groups. Consider getting involved. While quantum computing is part of a new sector, it's already starting to suffer from a lack of diversity. Some of this is caused by the predominance of white males with advanced science degrees. PhDs take time, but there are some quick ways to increase diversity. The industry will need a lot of software developers with undergrad degrees, for example. It should be possible to start doing more outreach to get a diverse group of students of all ages interested in pursuing a curriculum that leads to employment in the field. We also need to do a better job of outreach to enable all types of citizens of the world to understand the new technology and how it may affect their lives in the future. There's a lot to explore here. You can learn more by visiting the links in the show notes and maybe starting with the paper, the time to talk about the ethics of quantum computing is now. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Faye Waddleton for joining today to discuss her work on the ethics of quantum computing. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Pertivity's The Post-Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services of Pertivity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show. For more information on our quantum services, check out Pertivity.com or follow Pertivity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. Mm -hmm.